Aboriginal title is a common law doctrine that the land rights of indigenous peoples to customary tenure persist after the assumption of sovereignty under settler colonialism. The requirements of proof for the recognition of Aboriginal title, the content of Aboriginal title, the methods of extinguishing Aboriginal title, and the availability of compensation in the case of extinguishment vary significantly by jurisdiction. Nearly all jurisdictions are in agreement that Aboriginal title is inalienable, and that it may be held either individually or collectively. Aboriginal title was first acknowledged in the early 19th century, in decisions in which indigenous peoples were not a party. Significant Aboriginal title litigation resulting in victories for indigenous peoples did not arise until recent decades. The majority of court cases have been litigated in Australia, Canada, Malaysia, New Zealand, and the United States. Aboriginal title is an important area of comparative law, with many cases being cited as persuasive authority across jurisdictions. Many commentators believe that the doctrine is applicable in all common law legal systems. Aboriginal title is also referred to as indigenous title, native title particularly in Australia, original Indian title particularly in the United States, and customary title particularly in New Zealand. Aboriginal title jurisprudence is related to indigenous rights, influencing and influenced by non-land issues, such as whether the government owes a fiduciary duty to indigenous peoples. While the judge-made doctrine arises from customary international law, it has been codified nationally by legislation, treaties, and constitutions. <laughs> <laughs> British colonial legacy Aboriginal title arose at the intersection of three common law doctrines articulated by the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the Act of State Doctrine, the Doctrine of Continuity, and the Recognition Doctrine. The Act of State Doctrine held that the Crown could confiscate or extinguish real or personal property rights in the process of conquering, without scrutiny from any British court, but could not perpetrate an Act of State against its own subjects. The doctrine of continuity presumed that the Crown did not intend to extinguish private property upon acquiring sovereignty, and thus that pre-existing interests were enforceable under British law. Its mirror was the recognition doctrine, which held that private property rights were presumed to be extinguished in the absence of explicit recognition. In 1608, the same year in which the doctrine of continuity emerged, Edward Coke delivered a famous dictum in Calvin's case 1608 that the laws of all non-Christians would be abrogated upon their conquest. Coke's view was not put into practice, but was rejected by Lord Mansfield in 1774. The two doctrines were reconciled, with the doctrine of continuity prevailing in nearly all situations except, for example, public property of the predecessor state in Oyekin v. Adel 1957, the first indigenous land rights case under the common law, Mohegan Indians v. Connecticut, was litigated from 1705 to 1773, with the Privy Council affirming without opinion the judgment of a non-judicial tribunal. Other important Privy Council decisions include In Re Southern Rhodesia 1919 and Amodu Tajani v. Southern Nigeria Secretary 1921, the former rejected a claim for Aboriginal title, noting that some tribes are so low in the scale of social organization that their usages and conceptions of rights and duties are not to be reconciled with the institutions or the legal ideas of civilized society. Such a gulf cannot be bridged. Two years later, Amodu Tajani laid the basis for several elements of the modern Aboriginal title doctrine, upholding a customary land claim and urging the need to study of the history of the particular community and its usages in each case. Subsequently, the Privy Council issued many opinions confirming the existence of Aboriginal title, and upholding customary land claims, many of these arose in African colonies. Modern decisions have heaped criticism upon the views expressed in Southern Rhodesia. <laughs> <laughs> Doctrinal overview Recognition <laughs> 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 The requirements for establishing an Aboriginal title to the land vary across countries, but generally speaking, the Aboriginal claimant must establish exclusive occupation or possession from a long time ago, generally before the assertion of sovereignty, and continuity to the present day. Topic. Content Aboriginal title does not constitute allodial title or radical title in any jurisdiction. 
Instead, its content is generally described as a usufruct, i.e. a right to use, although in practice this may mean anything from a right to use land for specific, enumerated purposes, or a general right to use which approximate fee simple. It is common ground among the relevant jurisdictions that Aboriginal title is inalienable, in the sense that it cannot be transferred except to the general government known, in many of the relevant jurisdictions, as the Crown. Although Malaysia allows Aboriginal title to be sold between Indigenous peoples, unless contrary to customary law. Especially in Australia, the content of Aboriginal title varies with the degree to which claimants are able to satisfy the standard of proof for recognition. In particular, the content of Aboriginal title may be tied to the traditions and customs of the indigenous peoples, and only accommodate growth and change to a limited extent. Extinguishment Aboriginal title can be extinguished by the general government, but again, the requirement to do this varies by country. Some require the legislature to be explicit when it does this, others hold that extinguishment can be inferred from the government's treatment of the land. In Canada, the Crown cannot extinguish Aboriginal title without the explicit prior informed consent of the proper Aboriginal title holders. New Zealand formerly required consent, but today requires only a justification, akin to a public purpose requirement. Jurisdictions differ on whether the state is required to pay compensation upon extinguishing Aboriginal title. Theories for the payment of compensation include the right to property, as protected by constitutional or common law, and the breach of a fiduciary duty. Topic. Percentage of land Native title in Australia 1,228,373 square kilometres or approximately 16% of the country Indian reserves in Canada 28000 square kilometers 11000 square miles 0.2804% of Canada's land area Native community lands in Bolivia 16.8 million hectares 15% of Bolivia's land area Indigenous territories in Brazil 1105258 square kilometers 13% of the country's land area Indigenous territories in Colombia 1,141,748 square kilometers, 440,831 square miles, 31.5% of the country's land area. Indian reservations in the United States 56,200,000 acres, 22,700,000 hectares, 87,800 square miles, 227,000 square kilometers or 2.308% of the country's land area. Topic: History by jurisdiction. Topic: Australia Australia did not experience native title litigation until the 1970s, when Indigenous Australians both Australian Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders became more politically active. In 1971 Blackburn J. of the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory rejected the concept in Millerpum v. Nabalco Thai Limited the Gove Land Rights Case. The Aboriginal Land Rights Commission was established in 1973 in the wake of Millerpum. Paul Coe, in Coe v. Commonwealth 1979, attempted unsuccessfully to bring a class action on behalf of all Aborigines claiming all of Australia. The Aboriginal Land Rights Act 1976, established a statutory procedure that returned approximately 40% of the Northern Territory to Aboriginal ownership. The Anangu Pitjant Jatjara Yankanat Jatjara Land Rights Act 1981, had a similar effect in South Australia. The High Court of Australia, after paving the way in Mabo No. 1 by striking down a state statute under the Racial Discrimination Act 1975, overruled Millerpum in Mabo v Queensland No. 2 1992. Mabo No. 2, rejecting terra nullius, held that native title exists 6 to 1 and is extinguishable by the sovereign 7 to 0, without compensation 4 to 3. In the wake of the decision, the Australian Parliament passed the Native Title Act 1993 codifying the doctrine and establishing the National Native Title Tribunal 
Western Australia v Commonwealth upheld the NTA and struck down a conflicting Western Australia statute. In 1996, the High Court held that pastoral leases, which cover nearly half of Australia, do not extinguish native title in WIC peoples v Queensland. In response, Parliament passed the Native Title Amendment Act 1998, the 10 point plan, extinguishing a variety of Aboriginal land rights and giving state governments the ability to follow suit. Western Australia v Ward 2002 held that native title is a bundle of rights, which may be extinguished one by one, for example, by a mining lease. Yorta Yorta v Victoria 2002, an appeal from the first native title claim to go to trial since the Native Title Act, adopted strict requirements of continuity of traditional laws and customs for native title claims to succeed. Belize. In A.G. for British Honduras v Bristow 1880, the Privy Council held that the property rights of British subjects who had been living in Belize under Spanish rule with limited property rights, were enforceable against the Crown, and had been upgraded to fee simple during the gap between Spanish and British sovereignty. This decision did not involve indigenous peoples, but was an important example of the key doctrines that underlie Aboriginal title. In 1996, the Toledo Maya Cultural Council (TMCC) and the Toledo Alcaldes Association (TAA) filed a claim against the government of Belize in the Belize Supreme Court, but the court failed to act on the claim. The Maya peoples of the Toledo district filed a complaint with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights IACHR, which sided with the Maya in 2004 and stated that the failure of the government of Belize to demarcate and title the Maya cultural lands was a violation of the right to property in Article 23 of the American Declaration. In 2007, Chief Justice Abdullahi Kanta ruled in favor of the Maya communities of Canijo and Santa Cruz, citing the IACHR judgment and key precedents from other common law jurisdictions. The government entered into negotiations with the Maya communities, but ultimately refused to enforce the judgment. In 2008, the TMCC and TAA, and many individual alcades, filed a representative action on behalf of all the Maya communities of the Toledo district, and on 28 June 2010, C.J. Conta ruled in favor of the claimants, declaring that Maya customary land tenure exists in all the Maya villages of the Toledo district, and gives rise to collective and individual property rights under sections 3 D and 17 of the Belize Constitution. Topic. Botswana A Botswana High Court recognized Aboriginal title in Sasana and others v Attorney General 2006, a case brought by named plaintiff Roy Sasana, which held that the San have the right to reside in the Central Kalahari Game Reserve CKGR, which was violated by their 2001 eviction. The decision quoted Mabo and other international case law, and based the right on the San's occupation of their traditional lands from time immemorial. The court described the right as a right to use and occupy the lands, rather than a right of ownership. The government has interpreted the ruling very narrowly and has allowed only a small number of San to re-enter the CKGR. Topic. Canada Aboriginal title has been recognized in common law in Canada since the Privy Council, in St. Catherine's Milling v. The Queen 1888, characterized it as a personal usufruct at the pleasure of the Queen. This case did not involve indigenous parties, but rather was a lumber dispute between the provincial government of Ontario and the federal government of Canada. St. Catharines was decided in the wake of the Indian Act 1876, which laid out an assimilationist policy towards the Aboriginal peoples in Canada First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, allowed provinces to abrogate treaties until 1951, and made it a federal crime to prosecute First Nation claims in court, raise money, or organize to pursue such claims. Street. Catharines was more or less the prevailing law until Calder v. British Columbia Attorney General 1973. All seven of the judges in Calder agreed that the claimed Aboriginal title existed, and did not solely depend upon the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Six of the judges split three to three on the question of whether Aboriginal title had been extinguished. The Nisga'a did not prevail because the seventh justice, Pigeon J, found that the court did not have jurisdiction to make a declaration in favor of the Nisga'a in the absence of a fiat of the lieutenant governor of BC permitting suit against the provincial government. Section 91 of the Constitution Act, 1867. 
British North America Act 1867 gives the federal government exclusive jurisdiction over First Nations, and thus the exclusive ability to extinguish Aboriginal title. Section 35 of the Constitution Act, 1982 explicitly recognized and preserved Aboriginal rights. R. V. (1982), the first Supreme Court of Canada decision handed down after the Constitution Act 1982, declared that Aboriginal title was sui generis and that the federal government has a fiduciary duty to preserve it. R. V. Simon (1985) overruled R. V. Siloboy (1929), which had held that Aboriginal peoples had no capacity to enter into treaties, and thus that the numbered treaties were void. A variety of non-land rights cases, anchored on the Constitution Act 1982, have also been influential. Delgamuk v. British Columbia, 1997, laid down the essentials of the current test to prove Aboriginal title. In order to make out a claim for a Aboriginal title, the a Aboriginal group asserting title must satisfy the following criteria: i) the land must have been occupied prior to sovereignty; e) if present occupation is relied on as proof of occupation pre-sovereignty, there must be a continuity between present and pre-sovereignty occupation; and e) at sovereignty, that occupation must have been exclusive. Subsequent decisions have drawn on the fiduciary duty to limit the ways in which the Crown can extinguish Aboriginal title, and to require prior consultation where the government has knowledge of a credible, but yet unproven, claim to Aboriginal title. In 2014, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously for the plaintiff in Silkayan Nation v. British Columbia. Rejecting the government's claim that Aboriginal title applied only to villages and fishing sites, it instead agreed with the First Nation that Aboriginal title extends to the entire traditional territory of an indigenous group, even if that group was semi-nomadic and did not create settlements on that territory. It also stated that governments must have consent from First Nations which hold Aboriginal title in order to approve developments on that land, and governments can override the First Nations' wishes only in exceptional circumstances. The court reaffirmed, however, that areas under Aboriginal title are not outside the jurisdiction of the provinces, and provincial law still applies. <laughs> Malaysia Malaysia recognized various statutory rights related to native customary laws Adat", before its courts acknowledged the independent existence of common law Aboriginal title. Native Customary Rights and Native Customary Land are provided for under Section 4 of the National Land Code 1965, the Sarawak Land Code 1957, the respective provisions of the National Land Code Act 1963, and the Customary Tenure Enactment Raja's Order Ix of 1875 recognized Aboriginal title by providing for its extinguishment where cleared land was abandoned. Raja's Order 8 of 1920, Land Order 1920, divided state lands into four categories, one of them being native holdings, and provided for the registration of customary holdings. The Aboriginal Peoples Act 1954 creates Aboriginal areas and reserves, also providing for state acquisition of land without compensation. Article 160 of the Federal Constitution declares that custom has the force of law. Malaysian court decisions from the 1950s on have held that customary lands were inalienable. In the 1970s, Aboriginal rights were declared to be property rights, as protected by the federal constitution. Decisions in the 1970s and 1980s blocked state sanctioned logging on customary land. In 1997, Mokhtar Sidon JCA of the Johor High Court became the first Malaysian judge to acknowledge common law Aboriginal title in Adong bin Kawau v. Karajan Negri Johor. The High Court cited the Federal Constitution and the Aboriginal Peoples Act, as well as decisions from the Privy Council, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States. That case was the first time where Orang Asli directly and expressly challenged a state taking of their land. The opinion held that, The Aborigines' common law rights include, inter alia, the right to live on their land as their forefathers had lived. The case was upheld on appeal, but the federal court did not write an opinion. Later, High Court and Court of Appeal decisions built upon the foundation of Adong bin Kawau. 
However, the ability for indigenous peoples to bring such suits was seriously limited by a 2005 ruling that claims must be brought under O53 RHC, rather than the representative action provision. In 2007, the Federal Court of Malaysia wrote an opinion endorsing common law Aboriginal title for the first time in Superintendent of Lands v. Madali bin Salah. The Federal Court endorsed Mabo and Calder, stating that the proposition of law as enunciated in these two cases reflected the common law position with regard to native titles throughout the Commonwealth. The High Court of Kuching held in 2010, for the first time, that NCL may be transferred for consideration between members of the same community, as long as such transfers are not contrary to customary law. <laughs> New Zealand New Zealand was the second jurisdiction in the world to recognize Aboriginal title, but a slew of extinguishing legislation beginning with the New Zealand land confiscations has left the Maori with little to claim except for river beds, lake beds, and the foreshore and seabed. In 1847, in a decision that was not appealed to the Privy Council, the Supreme Court of the Colony of New Zealand recognized Aboriginal title in R. V. Simmons. The decision was based on common law and the Treaty of Waitangi Chapman J. went farther than any judge before or since in declaring that Aboriginal title cannot be extinguished at least in times of peace otherwise than by the free consent of the native occupiers. The New Zealand Parliament responded with the Maori Lands Act 1862 and the Native Rights Act 1865, which established the Native Land Court today the Maori Land Court to hear Aboriginal title claims, and if proven, convert them into freehold interests that could be sold to Pakeha New Zealanders of European descent. That court created the 1840 rule, which converted Maori interests into fee simple if they were sufficiently in existence in 1840, or else disregarded them. Simmons remained the guiding principle, until Y. Parada v. the Bishop of Wellington 1877. Y. Parada undid Simmons, advocating the doctrine of terra nullius and declaring the Treaty of Waitangi unenforceable. The Privy Council disagreed in Nireaha Tamaki v Baker, and other rulings, but courts in New Zealand continued to hand down decisions materially similar to Y. Parada. The Coal Mines Amendment Act 1903 and the Native Land Act 1909 declared Aboriginal title unenforceable against the Crown. Eventually, the Privy Council acquiesced to the view that the treaty was non-justiciable, land was also lost under other legislation. The Counties Act 1886 S.245 said that tracts over any Crown lands or native lands, and generally used without obstruction as roads, shall, for the purposes of this section, be deemed to be public roads, not exceeding 66 feet in width, and under the control of the Council. Opposition to such confiscation was met by force, as at Opuatia in 1894. A series of acts, beginning a year after the Treaty of Waitangi with the Land Claims Ordinance 1841, allowed the government to take and sell waste lands. Favorable court decisions turned Aboriginal title litigation towards the lake beds, but the Maori were unsuccessful in claiming the rivers the beaches, and customary fishing rights on the foreshore. The Limitation Act 1950 established a 12-year statute of limitations for Aboriginal title claims six years for damages, and the Maori Affairs Act 1953 prevented the enforcement of customary tenure against the Crown. The Treaty of Waitangi Act 1975 created the Waitangi Tribunal to issue non-binding decisions, concerning alleged breaches of the treaty, and facilitate settlements. Te Wihi v Regional Fisheries Office 1986 was the first modern case to recognize an Aboriginal title claim in a New Zealand court since Y Parada, granting non-exclusive customary fishing rights. The court cited the writings of Dr Paul McHugh and indicated that whilst the Treaty of Waitangi confirmed those property rights, their legal foundation was the common law principle of continuity. The Crown did not appeal Te Wihi which was regarded as the motivation for Crown settlement of the sea fisheries claims 1992. Subsequent cases began meanwhile, and apart from the common law doctrine, to rehabilitate the Treaty of Waitangi, declaring it the fabric of New Zealand society, and thus relevant even to legislation of general applicability. New Zealand Maori Council v Attorney General held that the government owed a duty analogous to a fiduciary duty toward the Maori. This cleared the way for a variety of treaty-based non-land Maori customary rights. 
By this time the Waitangi Tribunal in its Murifanua Fishing Report 1988 was describing treaty-based and common law Aboriginal title-derived rights as complementary and having an aura of their own. Circa the Te Ture Whenua Māori Act 1993, less than 5% of New Zealand was held as Māori customary land. In 2002, the Privy Council confirmed that the Māori Land Court, which does not have judicial review jurisdiction, was the exclusive forum for territorial Aboriginal title claims i.e. those equivalent to a customary title claim in 2003, Nati Appa v Attorney General overruled in Ray the 90 Mile Beach and Y Parada, declaring that Māori could bring claims to the foreshore in land court. The court also indicated that customary Aboriginal title interests non-territorial might also remain around the coastline. The Foreshore and Seabed Act 2004 extinguished those rights before any lower court could hear a claim to either territorial customary title the Maori Land Court or non-territorial customary rights the High Court's inherent common law jurisdiction. That legislation has been condemned by the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The 2004 Act was repealed with the passage of the Marine and Coastal Area Act 2011. Topic: <laughs> Papua New Guinea. The High Court of Australia, which had appellate jurisdiction before 1975, recognized Aboriginal title in Papua New Guinea decades before it did so in Australia, in Gaeta Sabia v Territory of Papua 1941, Administration of Papua and New Guinea v Dira Guba the Newtown case, and other cases. The Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea followed suit. Schedule II of the Constitution of Papua New Guinea recognizes customary land tenure, and 97% of the land in the country remains unalienated. South Africa In a Lexcor v Richtersveld Community 2003, a suit under the Restitution of Land Rights Act 1994, lawyers gathered case law from settler jurisdictions around the world, and judges of the Constitutional Court of South Africa talked frankly about Aboriginal title. The Land Claims Court had dismissed the complaint of the Richtersveld peoples, whose land was seized by a government-owned diamond mining operation. The Supreme Court of Appeal disagreed, citing Mabo and Yorta Yorta, but held that the Aboriginal title had been extinguished. Whether the precedent will be the start of further land rights claims by indigenous peoples is an open question. Given the cutoff date of 1913 in the Restitution Act, the case ultimately did not lead to the inclusion of the Aboriginal title in South African doctrine. Legal scholars allege that this is because the application of terms like indigenous and aboriginal in a South African context would lead to a number of contradictions. The identity of the indigenous groups in South Africa is not self evident. The adoption of a strict definition, including only communities descended from San and Koko people, would entail the exclusion of black African communities, an approach deemed detrimental to the spirit of national unity. The legacy of the Natives' Land Act also means that few communities retain relationships with the land of which they held before 1913. Tanzania In 1976, the Barabag people challenged their eviction from the Hanang district of the Manyara region, due to the government's decision to grow wheat in the region, funded by the Canadian Food Aid Programme. The wheat program would later become the National Agricultural and Food Corporation NAFCO. NAFCO would lose a different suit to the Mulbada Village Council in 1981, which upheld customary land rights. The Court of Appeal of Tanzania overturned the judgment in 1985, without reversing the doctrine of Aboriginal title, holding that the specific claimants had not proved that they were native. The extinction of Customary Land Right Order 1987, which purported to extinguish Barabag customary rights, was declared null and void that year. The Court of Appeal delivered a decision in 1994 that sided with the Aboriginal title claimant on nearly all issues, but ultimately ruled against them, holding that the Constitution Consequential, Transitional and Temporary Provisions Act, 1984 which rendered the constitutional right to property enforceable in court was not retroactive. In 1999, the Maasai were awarded monetary compensation and alternative land by the Court of Appeal due to their eviction from the Makomazi Game Reserve when a foreign investor started a rhino farm. The government has yet to comply with the ruling. <laughs> United States 
The United States, under the tenure of Chief Justice John Marshall, became the first jurisdiction in the world to judicially acknowledge in dicta the existence of Aboriginal title in series of key decisions. Marshall envisioned a usufruct, whose content was limited only by their own discretion, inalienable except to the federal government, and extinguishable only by the federal government. Early state court decisions also presumed the existence of some form of Aboriginal title. Later cases established that Aboriginal title could be terminated only by the clear and plain intention of the federal government, a test that has been adopted by most other jurisdictions. The federal government was found to owe a fiduciary duty to the holders of Aboriginal title, but such duty did not become enforceable until the late 20th century. Although the property right itself is not created by statute, sovereign immunity barred the enforcement of Aboriginal title until the passage of the Indian Claims Commission Act of 1946, which created the Indian Claims Commission, succeeded by the United States Court of Claims in 1978, and later the United States Court of Federal Claims in 1982. These bodies have no authority to title land, only to pay compensation. United States v. Alcia Band of Tillamooks was the first ever judicial compensation for a taking of Indian lands unrecognized by a specific treaty obligation. T. Hit Tun Indians v. United States established that the extinguishment of Aboriginal title was not a «taking» within the meaning of the Fifth Amendment. On the strength of this precedent, claimants in the Court of Federal Claims have been denied interest, which otherwise would be payable under Fifth Amendment jurisprudence, totaling billions of dollars, nine billion dollars alone, as estimated by a footnote in T. Hit Ton, in interest for claims then pending based on existing jurisdictional statutes. Unlike Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, the United States allows Aboriginal title to be created post-sovereignty rather than existing since pre-sovereignty. Aboriginal title need only have existed for a long time as little as 30 years to be compensable topic <inaudible> jurisdictions rejecting the doctrine there is no possibility for aboriginal title litigation in some commonwealth jurisdictions for instance barbados and pitcairn islands were uninhabited for hundreds of years prior to colonization although they had previously been inhabited by the arawak and carib and polynesian peoples respectively Topic India Unlike most jurisdictions, the doctrine that Aboriginal title is inalienable never took hold in India. Sales of land from indigenous persons to both British subjects and aliens were widely upheld. The Pratt York Opinion 1757, a joint opinion of England's Attorney General and Solicitor General, declared that land purchases by the British East India Company from the princely states were valid even without a Crown patent authorising the purchase. In a 1924 appeal from India, the Privy Council issued an opinion that largely corresponded to the continuity doctrine, Vahe Singhji Jarava Singhji v Secretary of State for India. This line of reasoning was adopted by the Supreme Court of India in a line of decisions, originating with the proprietary claims of the former rulers of the princely states, as well as their heirs and assigns. Adivasi land rights litigation has yielded little result. Most Adivasi live in state-owned forests. Topic notes topic References topic Further reading Comparative Bartlett, Richard H., and Jill Milroy eds. 1999. Native Title Claims in Canada and Australia, Delgamuk and Miriawang Gayarong. Richard A. Epstein, Property Rights Claims of Indigenous Populations, The View from the Common Law, 31 U Toledo L. Rev. 1 1999. Hazelhurst, Kayleen M. Ed. 1995. Legal Pluralism and the Colonial Legacy. Hawking, Barbara Ann, 2005. Unfinished Constitutional Business, Rethinking Indigenous Self-Determination. IWGIA, 1993. Never Drink from the Same Cup, Proceedings of the Conference on Indigenous Peoples in Africa. IWGIA, 2007. The Indigenous World. Liversage, Vincent, 1945. Land Tenure in the Colonies. PP 2 to 18 45 to 53 Meek CK 1946 Land Law and Custom in the Colonies McHugh PG 2011 Aboriginal Title The Modern Jurisprudence of Tribal Land Rights Oxford OUP 2011 McNeil Kent 1989 Common Law Aboriginal Title Oxford University Press McNeil Kent 2001 Emerging Justice, Essays on Indigenous Rights in Canada and Australia. Robertson, Lindsay G. 2005. 
Conquest by Law, How the Discovery of America Dispossessed Indigenous Peoples of Their Lands. Oxford University Press. ISBN 0-19514869-X. Slattery, Brian, 1983. Ancestral Lands, Alien Laws, Judicial Perspectives on Aboriginal Title. Young, Simon, 2008. Trouble with Tradition, Native Title and Cultural Change. Sydney, Federation Press. Blake A. Watson, The Impact of the American Doctrine of Discovery on Native Land Rights in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, 34 Seattle UL Rev. 507, 2011, Australia Bartlett, R. 2004, 2D ed. Native Title in Australia. Brockwell, Sally, 1979. Aborigines and the Law, a Bibliography. Law Reform Commission, 1986. The Recognition of Aboriginal Customary Laws. Report No. 31. Parliamentary Paper No. 136-1986. McCorkadale, John, 1987. Aborigines and the Law, a Digest. Reynolds, Henry. M. A. Stevenson and Surrey Ratnapala eds. 1993. Native Title and Pastoral Leases, in Mabo, A Judicial Revolution, The Aboriginal Land Rights Decision and Its Impact on Australian Law. Straline, L. 2009 2D ed. Compromised Jurisprudence, Native Title Cases Since Mabo. Aboriginal Studies Press, Canberra, Bangladeshuhia, 2000. Land Rights of the Indigenous Peoples of the Chittagong Hill Tracts, Bangladesh, Belize Grandi, Liza, 2006. Unsettling, Land Dispossession and the Guatemalan and Belizean Frontier Colonization Process, Canada Barros, John, 2002. Recovering Canada, The Resurgence of Indigenous Law. Clark, Bruce A. 1990. Native Liberty, Crown Sovereignty. Foster, Hamar, Heather Raven and Jeremy Weber, 2007. Let Right Be Done, Aboriginal Title, The Calder Case, and the Future of Indigenous Rights, Ghana Olanu, N.A. 1962. Customary Land Law in Ghana. Guyana Bennett, Gordon and Audrey Colson, 1978. The Damned, The Plight of the Akawayo Indians of Guyana, Hong Kong Nisim, Roger. 2008, 2D ed. Land Administration and Practice in Hong Kong, Kenya Mackenzie, Fiona. 1998. Land, Ecology, and Resistance in Kenya, 1880-1952. Odiambo, Atieno, 1981. Siasa, Politics and Nationalism in EA, Malaysiaremi Bulan. Native title is a proprietary right under the constitution in Peninsula Malaysia, a step in the right direction, 9 Asia Pacific Law Review 83 2001. Bulan, Rami. Native title in Malaysia, a complementary sui generis right protected by the federal constitution, 11 1 Australian Indigenous Law Review 54 2007. Gray, S. Skeletal Principles in Malaysia's Common Law Cupboard, The Future of Indigenous Native Title in Malaysian Common Law Lawasia Journal 99 2002. Porter, A. F. 1967. Land Administration in Sarawak, Namibia Legal Assistance Centre, 2006. Our Land They Took, San Land Rights Under Threat in Namibia. New Zealand Boast, Richard, Andrew Erueti, Doug McPhail and Norman F. Smith, 1999. Maori Land Law. Brookfield, FM 1999. Waitangi and Indigenous Rights. Erueti, A. Translating Maori Customary Title into Common Law Title, New Zealand Law Journal 421-423 2003. Gilling, Brian D. By Whose Custom? The Operation of the Native Land Court in the Chatham Islands, 23 -3 Victoria University of Wellington Law Review 1993. Gilling, Brian D. Engine of Destruction? An Introduction to the History of the Maori Land Court, Victoria U. Wellington L. Rev., 1994. Hill, R. Politicizing the Past, Indigenous Scholarship and Crown, Maori Reparations Processes in New Zealand, 16 Social and Legal Studies 163 2007. Lean, G. Fighting Them on the Benches, The Struggle for Native Title Recognition in New Zealand, 8 1. Newcastle Law Review 65 2004. McKayer, Ani and Milroy, Stephanie. Treaty of Waitangi and Maori Land Law, NZ Law Review 363 2000. McHugh, Paul G. 1983. Maori Land Laws of New Zealand, Two Essays. McHugh, Paul G. 1984. Aboriginal Title in New Zealand Courts, Two University of Canterbury Law Review 235-265. 
McHugh, Paul G. 1991. The Maori Magna Carta. Williams, David V. 1999. Te Kuti Tango Fanua, The Native Land Court 1864-1909, Papua New Guinea Mugamba, JT 2002. Land Law and Policy in Papua New Guinea. Sack, Peter G. 1973. Land Between Two Laws, Early European Land Acquisitions in New Guinea, South Africa Clausens, Aninka and Ben Cousins, 2008. Land, Power, and Custom, Controversies Generated by South Africa's Communal Land Rights Act, Tanzania Jaffet, Carrillo, 1967. The Meru Land Case. Peter, Chris Mena, 1997. Human Rights in Tanzania, Selected Cases and Materials. pp. 214-269. Peter, Chris Mena, and Helen Kehoe Bisimba, 2007. Law and Justice in Tanzania, Quarter a Century of the Court of Appeal. Shiv G., Issa G. 1990. State Coercion and Freedom in Tanzania. Human and People's Rights Monograph Series No. 8, Institute of Southern African Studies. Tenga, Ringo Willey, 1992. Pastoral Land Rights in Tanzania. Widner, Jennifer A. 2001. Building the Rule of Law, Zambiamvunga, Mponza p. 1982. Land Law and Policy in Zambia. Topic external links http colon slash slash www.ubcic.bc.ca slash resources slash implementation. HTM.